Federal District Judge Frank Minus Johnson, Jr. He was called the most hated man in Alabama during the 1950s and 60s. Johnson's court orders caused massive reforms in every facet of American society, including prisons, mental health, racial and sexual equality, and human rights. His mother's home here in Montgomery was bombed by unknown criminals during the turbulent late 50s and mid-60s. For Frank Minus Johnson, Jr., today was magnificent. After more than two decades on the district court bench, he was elevated to another level of the federal judiciary today. And in this same place where he was once the brunt of ugly remarks and attempted acts, he was publicly honored by judges, lawyers, and others in the judiciary as the role model for all federal judges. On this magnificent day for Frank Johnson, he left home for work early as usual. He stopped for a moment to give an early bird reporter outside his home a comment about the coming event. It'll be a, it'll be a bigger job, of course, because uh, you have jurisdiction extended from uh, one district to uh, many districts and over the southeastern part of the United States, and I'm looking forward to it. And then it was time for the investiture of Frank Minus Johnson, Jr. to the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. There were remarks praising him from several Bar Association officials. You have but to appear once in his court, and you will witness discipline in its sternest form. That discipline is always tempered with compassion and understanding, because Frank Johnson is also aware of the human frailties in others particularly of those who appear before him. His reputation among the lawyers in this district as an able and distinguished judge probably arises more out of his day-to-day -day work as a trial judge than out of the historically significant rulings scattered through the years. The Honorable Judge John R. Brown, Chief of the Fifth Circuit Court, swore Johnson into his new post. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. And then there were remarks from Judge Johnson, a rare thing for him over the years during his tenure on the federal bench, remarks about rulings that later became landmark decisions. The remarks were in that same stern voice that chill lawyers in his courtroom, accompanied by that same no-nonsense expression he's worn in the courtroom during his business of justice in this district. Those who hold there, as I do, the delicate balance of power in our federal system. It's important that those orders brought progress. With minimal disruption of state institutions and minimal intrusion into uh, state functions, I have hope that those orders will, in the wisdom of years to come, prove a functional architecture of law in those areas admired not for purity of style, but because they got the job done. Frank Minus Johnson has had other magnificent days. Most of them were in other states, by people other than Alabamians. Today it appeared that his own folks here in Alabama finally discovered the man in their own backyard who has changed the lives of all of us through rulings from his bench at the federal court. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News at the federal courthouse. He was hailed by Attorney General Griffin Bell as the role model for federal judges in America. Judge Johnson was sworn in by Chief Circuit Judge John R. Brown. Discharge the duties of the office, discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. In remarks after his investiture, Judge Johnson said he hopes his landmark decisions in matters of civil rights and human rights will be viewed in the future not for their style, but because they got the job done. It's important that those orders brought progress. With minimal disruption of state institutions and minimal intrusion into uh, state functions, I have hope that those orders will in the wisdom of years to come, prove a functional architecture of law in those areas, admired not for purity of style, but because they got the job done. 
The Johnson elevation to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals leaves a vacancy in the Middle District of Alabama. President Carter is now trying to decide who to appoint to that slot. Alabama Senators Stewart and Heflin have given the president their nominations, but there appears to be some controversy over which one it will be, Truman Hobbs or David Byrne. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News at the Federal District Court. Well, Mr. Folsom should know better than that. He himself, in the, in the emergency order, told us to not worry about future customers, to worry about keeping the lights on. Yet today he is concerned because we are now unable to serve new customers. Uh, he knows that the salaries of the executives of this company have been frozen since December. And he knows a lot of these things that, that, that indicate some amount of uh, unresponsible action on his part. He either didn't hear the testimony presented in this case or he has not read it. The Senate began its day around 12.30, and before it was over, 16 hours had passed. The Senate tackled some heavy legislation in those long hours. The education budget was placed at the top of a special order calendar. This did not mean the appropriations bill would be acted on immediately. Four days remain in the session, and many senators took the opportunity to introduce bills. Realistically, it was the last time a new piece of legislation would have time to make it through both houses. The Senate also had many local bills to act on. Eventually, the education budget came before the Senate. Gathered in the gallery were many teachers and others associated with education, like Paul Hubbard, Executive Secretary of the Alabama Education Association. Most stayed until the end. Committee amendments to the House version of the budget were adopted with little fanfare. The committee's substitute budget included removing liability insurance from the budget and adding 1.5 million absolute and another 1.5 million in conditional appropriations. Several floor amendments tried to further reduce the governor's war on illiteracy, one by three and another by seven million dollars. Both were defeated. The bill eventually passed 32 to two. If the House agrees to the Senate amendments, the bill will go to the governor. Otherwise, a conference committee will be set up to work out the differences. The hour was getting late. The legislative day ended at midnight Senate time. As luck would have it, the Senate clerk shifted gears and time seemed to grind to a halt. The Senate continued to work. The upper chamber adopted a House resolution rejecting the report of the Judicial Compensation Commission, which recommended substantial salary increases for state judges. The Alabama House put in a full day also, and it was reported that another mysterious case of clock failure struck that body just before midnight. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Public Service Commission President Juanita McDaniel said it would be next week before she would have a motion to make on the rate increase request filed by Alabama Power Company. Ms. McDaniel offered no comment on her reason for wanting to wait, but indicated there were some briefs that she had just received. Commissioner Jim Folsom, however, was ready with his proposal that he says will net the power company more revenue than they are presently asking for, but at the same time will not increase the customer's bill at all. In my opinion, the answer is joint generation, an arrangement whereby selected municipalities can buy into the company's generating capacity. Joint generation helped solve a similar problem in Georgia several years ago, and it has proven successful in a majority of the states of our country. Legislation for joint generation <coughs> would give the company $346 million, <coughs> and it passed the House yesterday and is now in a Senate committee. Folsom's proposal would also have made permanent the 9.5% emergency rate increase granted earlier this year. It would also allow for an additional 8% cost of living increase sometime next year. Folsom's bill would not have granted any more of the 33% rate increase being sought by the power company. Folsom's bill, however, died when neither Mrs. McDaniel or Commissioner Pete Matthews seconded it. Only seconds later, Commission President McDaniel moved to adjourn until next Thursday, the deadline for making a decision. But Folsom and Matthews protested, saying that making a decision on the deadline day was cutting it too close. If no decision is made by Thursday, the full amount, $288 million, would go into effect. The three finally decided to meet late Tuesday afternoon, giving them time to properly draw up an order on whatever decision is made. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News. 
The tournament began with an exhibition of 22,000 falling dominoes, started by the touch of one little finger. Then it was down to business, several hundred people competing for the top prize of $1,000. Many of the competitors are backroom at the general store players, but this is not a game to be taken lightly. Our family, we're a very close family. When we play dominoes, we're just enemies. I ain't got no specific way of playing. Just if the luck goes my way, it goes my way. It's 50-50. 50% luck and 50% how you play. If you get beat, they laugh at you pretty bad, so it's real serious. <laughs> it's really to have fun. I don't mean it's so serious that someone would go out and get in a fist fight or something if they didn't win. And there will be some signs put up, uh, smile, it's only a game or something. We don't want anyone to take it too seriously, but we do want our people who are interested in winning that $1,000 and that big trophy, so they take it seriously for that. The games will continue tomorrow morning with doubles competition and are expected to last well into the night. From the second annual World Domino Tournament in Andalusia, this is Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. Yeah, I would say fever coupled with headache and stiff neck uh, or coupled with confusion, uh, sometimes sort of a stuporous appearance, sort of as though one were intoxicated with alcohol, uh, difficulty walking sometimes, and of course in the more severe forms it could go on to coma. Since Bobby Fischer played in the World Championship in 1972, for instance, the membership in the Chess Federation has doubled. And um, we had a slump for a few years after Fischer evidently retired from chess. But the participation is picking up again. There are an infinite vari variety and number of possible games and an, an entire range of strategies and um, tactical shots that can come into play in the game. It's been estimated that there are more possible games of, of chess than there are atoms in the universe. The year was 1950. The scene was much like this one. There were the crowds, the drivers, the cars, and the dream of reaching the finals of the Soapbox Derby in Akron, Ohio. 29 years ago, the checkered flag signaled the winner. Today, that flag was out again. The Montgomery Optimist Club and radio station WLWI sponsored this year's derby, which attracted 48 participants from across Alabama. The cars were brought to Montgomery Street for final inspection this morning around 8. There was the Black Phantom, the Blue Bomber, and other appropriately named wooden vehicles, all of which would carry the driver to victory. To start off the event, Montgomery Mayor Emery Falmer was pitted against finish line director Ray Scott. Police Chief Charles Swindle christened the mayor's car with the department's emblem 
while the mayor had an officer check on Scott's driver's license. Shortly, both men were in the driver's seat waiting for the green flag. Derby officials noted Scott won the race, beating the mayor by a car length. With a radar gun, officers clocked the vehicles at 30 miles an hour. The wooden cars are built from one of seven kits, all approved by the National Soapbox Derby Association. The plans, along with the kit, sells for $50 and comes with everything but the wood and the wheels. Derby director Jim Sexton says the cars can be built within an average of 48 hours, but the testing never ends. Well, it teaches uh, kids skills that are lasting throughout his life, and it sort of, the program ties the kid in a little bit closer with the parents because in five, six months, some of them spent building these cars. It's, I think, brought a lot of them really close together in the past year. How many areas are involved in today's competition? We have 187 cities in the United States. We're the only city in the state of Alabama that's running a race. So. And from here, where do the winners go? Akron, Ohio, to the All-American. August the 5th, they'll leave here. And the national race is uh, August the 11th. The competition lasted all day long, and when it was over, Robert Cowlin of Jackson, Alabama, came out on top. He will receive a one-year scholarship to Troy State University and $300, along with the chance to compete in the 42nd National Soapbox Derby in Akron, Ohio, in four weeks. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. After two full days of competition, the 1,100 players were narrowed to a few groups of doubles, with those who were knocked out of the tournament looking on. The children's competition came down to two Andalusia boys. 12-year-old Michael Jones was the winner. I just picked all that I could and knew what he had and played off all the points I could. But the nine-year-old runner-up still has a few good years left in him. Competition for the big trophy and the $1,000 singles prize lasted until about midnight. In the end, Jerry Simmons of Ozark succumbed to the skill and luck of R.M. Hadley from Atmore. Hadley made a clean sweep of the tournament, but there's always next year. From the second annual World Championship Domino Tournament in Andalusia, this is Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. This kinder care center on Sunshine Drive in Montgomery stands as the first of 351 such facilities across America. The center opened its doors July 14, 1969, and to commemorate the beginning of a new era, kinder care president Perry Mendel and other company executives, along with Montgomery Mayor Emery Falmer, unveiled a monument. What about the company's future? Well, after 10 years, I feel like we're really just beginning. As far as we've come, we've got a lot further to go, and what started me off in this business is the same reason that we continue to build additional daycare centers, and that is the increase in the women's, uh, women of America entering the uh, workforce of America. This is what's making the uh, need is there, and we are offering the service that evidently has been most acceptable to the parents of preschool children throughout the land. Following the brief ceremony, the festivities moved to the Civic Center for a gala birthday party and spree for muscular dystrophy. There were plenty of games to play, all at no charge. However, donations were accepted. Along with the entertainment by Ronald McDonald and friends later in the day, there were balloons to hold and cotton candy to eat. Most of the 1,500 children and their parents did a little of everything, and that's what the Kinder Care birthday party was all about. A family day of fun for a worthwhile cause. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. Emil Vaughn leading from start to finish after the opening 66 on Friday has won the Montgomery Country Club Invitational Golf Tournament. The 66th of these invitationals, one of the oldest in the South. Emil had a huge four-shot lead as began play today on one guy. He had an eight-shot lead on the field. We asked him how he approached his final round with that big lead. Well, I tried to play as well as I could. I was really had in my mind to break the tournament record, but I really just fell short. You got to saving a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> sure did. Look, you've played great this summer. This is your best summer for golf, hasn't, hasn't yeah. it been? Yeah, uh, definitely. 
This is a pretty big win. Yeah, this golf tournament is, really means a lot to me. It has a lot of tradition behind it, and uh, I really wanted it. I think more than any that I've played in so far. You, uh, you were in, I, I know you're encouraged. Now, does this mean that uh, having done as well as you have this year, you've won several invitations? What, last week you were second in that big tournament? Yeah, over the spirit, I finished second. Yeah, one shot back. You going to turn pro? I really can't say the possibility is there. Yeah. Uh, Depends on you get backing, that sort of thing? Uh, maybe, and uh, I can't really say for certain whether I am or not I because it'll, it'll, rude, yeah. it'll right. void my amateur status. If you if you decide, then the fall school would be in your mind. Huh? Yeah, I would think so. Congratulations. It's a good win for you. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. Bob Dumas of Saugahatchee Country Club in Auburn closed with a 69 today, the best score of the day to take second place. Lane Wallach, who has won this Invitational four times, trying to become the first man to win it five times, shot a 73 today and finished well off the pace. This is Phil Snow reporting from the Montgomery Country Club. The technical aspects of how much nuclear energy we use, how much coal we use, how much solar energy we develop, we solve those problems like we went to the moon. But unless we underwrite them, first and foremost, with that which is right in principle and in spirit, there's all to no avail. I thought the speech was very good and probably the most forceful speech he's made since he's been in office. You think it'll help him any? I sure do. I think his popularity will be up well substantially today. What about the energy position he took? Well, I think there's a lot of people that won't like it, but I think it's needed and I think it's what's best for the nation at this time. And I think it, he thinks that's what should be done and people are just going to have to get behind him. It's going to take all the people and not him. Well, some of it made sense and some of it didn't. What about his energy proposals? Well, I hope he can straighten it out because it really puts depression on me. And I hope he do something with it. I live it's all right. I, I think he had some good points and so forth. But I still think Conley was right. What was that? About, about how to handle the energy problem as far as the uh, uh, getting domestic crude and everything from here in America and build up from that. I feel like he's definitely concerned about our problems with energy, and uh, I hope that the people will, will be behind him and do what we can to help conserve energy. Some of it was good. I think a lot of people already knew what he said. We already knew this was, this was here, and uh, some of the proposals were good. And then Energy-wise? Energy-wise. And I like his plan about everyone coming together, but I think a lot of people already knew what he said. We know the you think this helped his sagging popularity? Yes, I think it did, because if the, uh, everyone anticipated this speech, and uh, I like the manner that he spoke in, but, you know, we just have to wait and see. I think a lot of people would like a short-term uh, resolution to the problems. He seems to think that all the legislators and nothing else can't straighten out uh, what is actually happening here. That's what he seems to think, but, you know, only the thing that we can do is to pray and hope for the best and work together as a team, and when you work together as a team, you can get things did. Yesterday, Emil added another title to his growing list of wins this summer. He shot rounds of 66, 70, 72 to win the Montgomery Country Club Invitational by six strokes. He is only the third golfer to score below par for the three rounds at the Montgomery Country Club Invitational. Emil has had a tremendous summer, winning at Prattville, at Woodley, at Stillwaters, and at Arrowhead. As a collegian, he led Middle Tennessee State University to the Ohio Valley Conference title. Last week, in the Spirit of America tournament at Decatur, Alabama, one of the better collegiate tournaments, he was medalist and finished second by just one shot. Now the question is, will he follow other Bonnie Crest alumni, Mac McClendon and Buddy Gardner, into the pro ranks? I really can't say the possibility is there. Yeah. Uh, Depends on you get backing, that sort of thing? Uh, maybe, and uh, I can't really say for certain whether I am or not I because it'll, rude, yeah. it'll right. void my amateur status. If you, if you decide, then the fall school would be in your mind. Huh? Yeah, I would think so.
In the meantime, Emil will finish up his college work at AUM and work on his game, and no doubt wonder if he can make it in big time golf. Governor James told the Rotarians one very important thing he has learned about being governor is to establish a solid relationship with the House and Senate. Furthermore, Governor James said passing the two main budgets for the state is no easy task either. Well, number one, I found out there's two budgets. You know, that is a big thing on the House, on the Hill up there. Those things tear a legislative session apart because it brings out all of the factions, all of the various groups, and it's kind of like a good old family fight when you start dividing up the money. Continuing his evaluation of state government, James said part of the blame for the failure of his gas tax proposal was a lack of communication with the House and Senate. But he said he would still have introduced the proposal for the tax. If I had it to go again, I'd introduce it at the same time, right at the heat of all the fuss. Because so often, I've observed over the years that if something is solid and right, it's like a boomerang. It may be thrown out today, but it'll come right back and hit you between the eyes in a matter of several months. James said there should be some sort of limitation to public office holding, and it's very important that terms of office be looked at, especially on the federal level. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. The thermostats on state office buildings had been set in the low 70s. Now employees will have to get used to working in offices 78 degrees or hotter. State Finance Director David Bronner says trying to maintain a steady temperature could pose a problem. We were supposed to comply almost instantaneously like many federal regulations, but it's difficult to find all the thermostats, first of all. But uh, what, what it is, it's a very severe penalty. It's a $10,000 fine if you do not do it. So obviously we're about to start and go ahead and complete it as quickly as we can. Our real problem is that many of the buildings are very old. Uh, some of them, like in this office, has an air conditioning unit which has no temperature on it at all. It's either on or it's either off. A couple of places will escape the decree ordered for all non-residential buildings. One is the computer center. Bronner says Mississippi destroyed two million dollars worth of computers by setting their thermostats too high. The State Archives and History Building also will be allowed to maintain a lower temperature. Delicate items such as this 1718 map could deteriorate if it gets too hot and humid. But employees in other buildings simply will have to grin and bear the heat. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. Our financial advisors say that after the bill has been enacted, that they can have the money, that we can have the money between six and nine months. So it's, it's, this is a, a short term uh, advantage to the power company. It's not something that's going to take four or five years for them to get advantage of. February 16, 1973. Prisoners of war from Vietnam land at Maxwell Air Force Base. Maxwell was one of the regional Air Force bases in the United States designated for Project Homecoming. Altogether, some 43 POWs passed through Maxwell between February 14 and April 8. Today, some former prisoners of war and family members of some of those still missing in action attended the ceremony at Maxwell. They joined with Lieutenant General Stanley Umstead, the commander of the Air University, in reviewing the parade ceremonies honoring the POWs and MIAs. One man who was listed as both a prisoner of war and missing in action is Colonel Bob Lilly. Colonel Lilly's helicopter was shot down on November 6, 1965, 
and he remained a prisoner in North Vietnam for seven years and three months. He hopes this special recognition day will keep the memory of those missing in action alive. I hope it will serve to further enlighten the public that indeed there still are missing in action in Southeast Asia. And if indeed that occurs, hopefully it'll be productive. Until there's a final accounting of those that are still listed as missing in action in Southeast Asia, our involvement in that conflict is not ended. In proclaiming July 18th as POW MIA Recognition Day, President Carter said it's appropriate that all Americans recognize the special debt owed those Americans held prisoner during wartime and that we remember the unresolved casualties of war, our soldiers who are missing. The ceremony concluded with the Alabama Air National Guard flying the missing man formation. Michael Jones, WSFA TV News. It's like a lot of machine in the car to vote. Once again, the House tried for the necessary votes to pass the education budget, and once again it failed. The budget bill has lingered in the House for two days since passing out of the Senate. The motions ran high as the rules were not suspended. Speaker Joe McCorkadale took a rather stern position that the measure was again dead. Later, McCorkadale said he had been told that Paul Hubbard, the executive secretary of the Alabama Education Association, was saying that he did not want the budget bill passed in the regular session because he could get a better deal in a special session. Hubbard said that statement's not true. Well, I'm not going to get an argument with the House Speaker on television about the issue. I would simply say this, uh, that right now there is no raise. And if the session ends without a raise, then certainly there's nothing that uh, can be worse in terms of uh, the cost of living raise. Now, it would be bad in terms of there not being a budget. I don't think anyone wants a special session. I don't. I don't know anyone who does. In the Senate, a bill was passed giving over $12 million more to the state's Medicaid program if the money is available. This would help out the current situation with nursing homes, which say that they will close before the end of the fiscal year in September because of a lack of state funds. Also on the agenda for consideration by the Senate is a bill designed to strengthen the Alabama Commission on Higher Education. The bill would give the commission regulatory powers over duplication of college programs. Amendments have been added to that bill which would attempt to grandfather in some institutions. Propagate Former state son. senator Sid McDonald, who is working for Governor James on the legislation, says Troy State University is trying to make waves and sink the bill. Simply put, they want to run a state institution spending state money, state taxpayers' money, doing a state delegated role without any interference by any state authority. They want to do it the way they want to do it. Their administration wants to do it. And in effect, to hell with everybody else. The House and Senate return on Thursday for the next to the last legislative day of the session. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. Hopefully continue the downward trend in our crime index. We have found that those neighborhoods are having lower crime because of the very fact that the neighborhood watch. Six, seven, eight, nine. According to education sources here in Alabama, a Justice Department review of its probe in Alabama is due at any time. One of those who has knowledge of the situation is Dr. John Porter, Commission on Higher Education. The Office of Civil Rights came to the state last April and began a study on the, the determination of the vestiges of a dual system in the state. Uh, that study continued through May and June. and was basically completed as far as on site. We've been expecting a report for a number of months and uh, it's not been forthcoming. What is expected to be the result of that report? Is it expected that the university and college system will be told you have a dual system, you must consolidate some schools or merge some? Well, I don't think that they would be likely to say merge. Uh, in no other state, there were 10 original Adam states where this has occurred earlier. In no instance there has HEW 
said the solution to your problems is merge. They have suggested that you have problems here uh, in a place where there might be a predominantly black and a predominantly white school offering the same courses, but they have not gone so far yet as to say you need to merge in this place. Records show more than 110,000 students attend Alabama's colleges and universities. The faculties at those schools number over 4,000 professors and instructors. We are told if the government finds that the state still maintains predominantly racially divided schools, several actions could be ordered by the ATW. They include the state of Alabama will have three to five months to come up with a plan to correct racial balances. ATW then may ask for staff changes along racial lines and also a reshuffling of the enrollment at the schools. All these changes will come after the state submits a five-year plan, and if ATW is satisfied, the implementation will begin. At this point, Alabama officials are checking the morning mail each day for the new results. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. Within one day of a deadline for making a ruling on a rate increase request, the Public Service Commission approved on a two-to-one vote a 23.5% annual increase in rates for Alabama Power Company. The increase will come in three segments, the first being the 9.5% increase granted during the emergency hearings last April. The second will come at the end of the next billing period in July for Alabama Power in the amount of a 5% annual increase. The third segment of the increase will come in the first billing period after January 1, 1980. That increase will be an 8% cost of living adjustment. The total of the three segments will come out just over $200 million. The proposal was made by Commissioner Pete Matthews. I talked to any number of experts and that was the figure that uh, was most suggested as a bottom line at which the power company could get back in the ball game. Commission President Juanita McDaniel, who said she had no proposal of her own, seconded Matthews' motion and joined him in voting for it. Jim Folsom, who had offered only a 15.5% increase last week, voted against the motion. Folsom had suggested the utility survive on a joint generation bill now before the Senate, but both other commissioners felt it unwise to count on a bill that has not passed the Senate yet. The power company, meanwhile, reacted with delight, but indicated that it must still determine the effects of anything less than the $288 million they had originally sought. We're going to plug the figure in and see what we can do and can't do. Our, our primary goal would be to get the Farley Unit 2 started again. We've got to get that construction began, and we want to start the Miller Unit back, and we're just going to have to see exactly how much this is going to generate and what we can start and when we can start it back. But we hope to get the company back into a normal position as quickly as possible. Do you anticipate another priorities list? Well, we have a priorities list, of course, that we've been working on, and we're just going to take this money and see what we can do with it, plug it in, and then uh, we may have to establish another priorities list, but we'll just look at it with over the next few weeks and see where we are as a company now. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News. Well, yes, that's a you know a good ballpark to hit in. You know, I hit a lot of home runs there in uh, '77, but this year I didn't get a chance to play there because of the uh, when we went up there, I hit the broke foot, mm -hmm. and like I think we go there after the All Star break. But mm -hmm. there should be a lot of home runs hit out there tonight. 316 down the lines and 365 in the power alleys. Uh, uh, Ryan has been uh, homered four times uh, off of out there. Uh, so you think we're going to see maybe a record in home runs tonight? Well, it could be, you know, like uh, the pitching is good, you know. They got good pitching going tonight for both sides. And, uh, like, uh, it could be a lot of home runs hit there because, you know, the, in the alleys, like the fly balls, there's some of them catching the other ballparks. They go out of that ballpark. Mm -hmm. And, like, the only dead spot in the ballpark is straightaway center, and I think it's 400 feet. So, What do you think about the American League going with so many uh, relief pitchers? Well, like, you know, an all-star game, I think that's good because, like, an all-star game, you know, a pitcher ain't going to pitch but two or three in and, Three innings is the limit I think they can go, so that's a good idea. And, you know, they got some good relief pitches. The relief pitching this year is having an outstanding year. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Curran is having an outstanding year for us, you know. Mm -hmm. I think he could 10 and 2 or something like that.
Alabama Nursing Home Association spokesman Wallace Nelson says their group has done all it can to try and save the now financially ailing industry. In a statement, Nelson accused the Medical Services Administration of having underestimated the needed revenue for this year by $20 million, and then only asking for just over $8 million in supplemental appropriations. Nelson says the Legislative Fiscal Office concedes that funds are available in the general fund if the legislature wants to step in and aid the nursing home industry. But instead, Nelson says they've been told to borrow from banks at their own risk, depending on the legislature to pay them back out of next year's funds. Now we are running out with two months left in this year with, a, with the statement that next year will be paid for this year out of next year's funds. And already they admit that we are uh, short in our funds for the coming year. So if we go into next year to pay for this year, then the crisis is going to come up again as early as December and uh, maybe even earlier than that, which will have this same crisis over again. There are only two legislative days left in the session, prompting the Nursing Home Association to take a hardline approach to their demand, including numerous such news conferences and a statewide advertising campaign aimed at convincing the public that nursing homes will become a thing of a past if the legislature doesn't respond quickly. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. Court of Appeals to a